Good afternoon, South Africa. Good afternoon to all our participants on our webinar this afternoon. My name is Gerald Mwandiambira, and I'm here representing the South African Savings Institute. I'd like to welcome you to the third of our webinars and for our series of webinars for July Savings Month, which is National Savings Month. And if you're joining us for the first time now, you've missed a lot. You've missed a, where, a webinar where we address the concerns of the youth and how they can start preparing for adult life in terms of their finances. Um, and also you missed another webinar where we spoke about the future of the stock fell and how stock fells are becoming a lot more sophisticated and geared for the modern life of investments and more sophisticated um, classes of assets. So if you want to catch up on those webinars, they are available on the SASI Facebook and YouTube pages. So fear not, but thank you for joining us this afternoon. This afternoon is a great afternoon. We're here to discuss SMEs, small and medium enterprises. And we're going to talk about entrepreneurship and what many people want to know is how can I start my own business? How can I manage my business, especially with the challenges which everyone is facing currently right now. Millions of small businesses are faced with huge obstacles as the coronavirus has shut down much of our economy and staying afloat has become a challenge and entrepreneurs have had to find creative ways to adapt on the fly, restructure funding, and even manage that thing they call cash flow. Join us as we discuss some of these challenges this afternoon. We've got two awesome speakers lined up for us. Um, firstly, firstly, we've got um, Gugum Mfupi, who's a conversation strategist, broadcaster on Kaya 95.9, entrepreneur. She's basically an entrepreneur. She's a self-made, she's a brand. She's someone who basically knows and the pain of the gig economy, someone who knows the pain of running a small business, invoicing, waiting for that payment, all those challenges which small businesses face. We're going to have a talk from Google who's going to share with us how she has survived through this pandemic, the lessons she has learned, and also some of the insights which she gains because in one of her other roles, she's always hobnobbing around the world, rubbing shoulders with some of the business leaders we can only dream of ever meeting. So over to you, Gugu, what do you have for us in store this afternoon? Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time today, Gerald, and to our participants and audience members who have joined us. We're really excited that we can uh, share some of this content with you here today. Now, we are mindful of the fact that we are living in a virtual world. So whilst we're not able to physically interact and be in touch with one another, I am looking forward to some of your feedback through the chat service, through the Q&A session, and looking forward to some of the questions and the themes that many of you will be able to raise and share with us here today, as we really look to distill and unpack a rather important topic and subject that is uh, quite close to my heart. So if you are present, we're looking forward to your feedback, and I'm quite excited to hear what your thoughts are on uh, the current economic environment. For the moment, as we know, given the virtual world that we live in, we are quite uh, keen to uh, share some details with you. So I'll open up a presentation that I want to share with you as I look to distill um, some of the highlights and uh, elements that I'd like to share with you in conversation here today. So as we do in this virtual realm that I live, that we live in, uh, the proverbial, can you see my screen? If possible, please give me a thumbs up, um, even if it happens to be one of the emoji cons uh, that you can actually make use of in conversation today. Well, I'm hoping that all of you can see my screen. And as Gerald has mentioned, entrepreneurship. I've uh, titled this particular presentation, It's a Hard Knock Life. Because the truth is for many South Africans and entrepreneurs, um, one thing that we often understand is that it's quite a challenging environment to do business in. Thank you so much for the thumbs up as well as uh, confirming that you can see my screen. Coming back to the presentation though, what I do want to share with you is the fact that uh, it's been a difficult one for many entrepreneurs, specifically for individuals like myself. I have a very interesting environment that I operate in. And that's the fact that I don't necessarily work as an entrepreneur who has a product uh, that's on the shelf and easy to take off. 
but uh, one that is based on conversations, largely leveraging on research material that I compile together with the clients that I work with, and uh, then leverage on the partnerships and communication strategies that we're able to implement in sharing uh, some of the strategies they'd like to follow through with. So that's essentially my role as a conversation strategist, working with clients within the corporate space, government and civil society institutions, and helping them have simple conversations that speak to the members that they want to address, to source solutions, highlight challenges, and create an overall sense of awareness of the mandate that they look to serve in society. One of the other elements that uh, um, uh, was highlighted by Gerald is the fact that I do have the fortunate opportunity to wear multiple hats. And uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I often work as a financial journalist broadcasting business and financial news on a number of media platforms. And this does help me understand the overriding experience of many entrepreneurs given the macroeconomic backdrop that we have in South Africa. So as we always do, before we get to understand the nuances of individuals, we wanna understand what the overall climate is. And this is where I'd like us to start for today. Understanding the performance of SMMEs within South Africa's economy and the pressure points that we've certainly experienced. Well, it's well documented that even before COVID-19 and the pandemic hit us, South Africa's economy has been struggling. We've been struggling to meet great targets in terms of economic growth performance, reaching the targets in terms of uh, unemployment uh, and mitigating unemployment specifically within the youth environment, and also making sure that we're able to attract the necessary economic climate and investment that comes into the country. One certainly does think about how the pandemic hit back in March last year and the subsequent lockdowns resulted in, again, significant losses of uh, jobs. Not only were industries brought to a halt, but it exacerbated the climate of job to unemployment as well as retrenchments that recently took place in the South African environment. What we also need to be cognizant of focusing on is the most recent SA shutdown. Just one week of looting has certainly resulted in damages to South Africa's economy that are still being collated today by leading retail companies and property firms who have yet to finalize the final number of damage that has occurred. But one thing's for certain is that what we've witnessed there is that the numbers are adding up. And according to SAPOA, the South African Property Owners Association, in total, the damage that has been caused to a lot of the retail centers, the warehouses, the ATMs and communication infrastructure, just to name but a few, will likely cost the South African economy about 50 billion Rand in GDP. That's quite substantial. It's a huge number, one that might still be able to be covered by insurance, specifically the South African Special Risks Insurance Association or SASRIA, who will bear the burden of that cost. But what we're mindful of is that this means that the tellers, the securities at the parking lots, the packers who pack the goods and services we need on the retail shelves. If we take a look at the guys and uh, companies that manage the services of shopping malls, making sure that the electricity is working, making sure that all the automated doors and security service are also in place, those particular jobs at the moment have literally been put to a halt. And this speaks to a report that's also recently been published by PwC, highlighting that on the back of the looting, what we'll witness in South Africa is a significant shortage of jobs. Upwards of 50,000 jobs might actually be at risk of not resurfacing in the local economy as investors look to readapt or change the manner within which they actually conduct their services, given the current violence and of course the looting that we witnessed in the last week. So one thing's for sure, the second quarter GDP figures will be closely monitored. We did see a pickup in the first quarter, just around 1.1%, about 4.3% if it's annualized. We know that unemployment is going to be an additional pressure point. That figure currently sits just below 33% in South Africa. But when we do take a look and reflect on the second quarter and third quarter numbers, these will definitely have a significant impact on South Africa's economic performance. And what does this do? It takes away the cultivating environment that entrepreneurs and SMMs need in order to make sure that they are able to thrive. So this adds on to the pressure that many entrepreneurs are likely going to face in the upcoming months. And not just the kind of entrepreneurs who are building their businesses and operations within the services or product space, but even for entrepreneurs who align their business strategies to that of big corporates. Think of companies like Musica, Dion Wyatt, uh, and even a few others like Flight Center, who recently have had to shut down in recent months due to the economic climate and the extensive pressure points of the lockdown criteria. 
all of these actually speak to the value chain and supply chain, which will likely impact the growth of entrepreneurs within this sector. So one thing's for certain is that we are still going to see a lot of pressure being faced by entrepreneurs in South Africa. So that sets the backdrop for the overview of entrepreneurship in South Africa, but I'd like to share my personal story and my experience, and maybe starting off from my journey. Like many South Africans, I perhaps started off with a side hustle before delving into the world of entrepreneurship. I'm fortunate enough to operate and work within the media space, having worked in TV, radio, corporate speaking, as well as print media. And the opportunities that this has opened up for me is to actually uh, continue to present, facilitate, moderate, and MC conversations with clients, which initially started off as being part of the gig economy, where intermittently I'd have the opportunity to engage with clients, conduct speaking services, and then be remunerated for it. Instead of this just being additional income that popped into my bank account as a sole proprietor, I then transitioned in 2014 to open up a business account and actually follow through with the necessary procedures to have an established communications company. This in itself, like for many entrepreneurs, came with a few hurdles because what it does actually speak to is making sure that you understand your value proposition, going back to what the basics and the foundation of your business actually is and making sure that you form the right networks within your communities to make sure that business is sustainable. Now, Mr. G might have mentioned slightly earlier that I've had the opportunity to travel and uh, speak to uh, many leaders on a continental scale and even globally to fully unpack and understand what their strategies are and engage with them in conversations. So typically, as depicted by this image, I'd be able to sit across individuals at corporate conferences, um, host interviews and conduct uh, television productions on location, traveling vast areas either of the country or of the continent. But we all know that COVID happened. And in the month of March, when the announcement was essentially made by the president that we'd be moving to a hard lockdown in South Africa, this is where my income supply and revenue projections for at least the first quarter of the year essentially dried up for a good period of at least uh, three weeks worth of work, which entailed some traveling, which entailed additional speaking activities. This is where my revenue literally dried up. Now, fortunately, there were some clients who were able to pivot and switch up to the new digital age that we live in. But that meant it came at a significant cost where I myself had to uh, recreate the services that I offer, where ordinarily speaking in front of streams of audiences, recording voiceovers within highly equipped and established studios, and of course also broadcasting from studios of major technology or major media companies all came to a grinding halt. And much like you and many other South Africans, my dining room table became my office space for a good period of 2020. This in itself did require that I had to switch up on the back of COVID. This essentially spoke to adapting to this virtual world that we live in. So fair enough, when it comes to the world of events, this has been slightly easier as webinars and conferencing material and uh, products have actually made it so much easier for us to interact. But it also came with a substantial investment, not only in the equipment that I owned, making sure that data connectivity was also efficient, purchasing goods like ring lights. And at some point, trust me, those files did move away and I was able to purchase a laptop stand. But these are all some of the shock waves that I had to absorb as a entrepreneur. Number one, making sure that I'm actually fully equipped to manage the um, limitations on cash flow and revenue that was anticipated to be generated. And then secondly, making sure that I had all the necessary equipment in order to adapt to the new environment of working in a virtual world. I've often made the joke that this is where I had to become my own makeup artist, my own director, my own production manager, managing cameras, lights, and all the action and research that comes behind it. So as an entrepreneur, this certainly became a new jurisdiction and a new realm within which to work in. This also spoke about flexibility. And as we are doing in this current virtual world that we live in, often at times with a live event where people are interacting and in person, it's, uh, we often are able to work within a structured system, coordinate, communicate any particular changes that might have to be implemented. But in a virtual world where we are limited in terms of the amount of interaction we can have, this really called for myself to improve on my level of flexibility, managing technicalities when the line goes down, 
making sure to unmute when you are the speaker who needs to be focused on, and also prioritizing the right equipment, the right lighting, managing content when either your guests or audience members are not able to participate. And of course, making sure that I maintain the quality of the production by sharing energy and excitement with you as an audience, even though I'm unable to solicit some of your responses live and in person. So very briefly, what this led me to learn over the period of COVID and of course the uh, importance that of a number of elements that came to the fore was these three elements that I do want to uh, around, share some details uh, and uh, provide clarity on. My personal experience is that when it came to COVID and the move to March of 2020, where everybody was doing everything virtually, technology has become a great friend, but it can be a fickle friend either in terms of the connectivity that we have, but also the access and opportunities it's provided us with when it comes to social media. And for many platforms, be it Facebook, be it Instagram, be it Twitter, we've seen how these particular social media platforms have evolved for in themselves to be areas where conversations can be held live. And this is really democratized access for conversation strategists like myself to actually meet new clients, interact, share their value, and of course, solicit new streams of income and revenue. This actually meant that I needed to make sure that as a brand, a brand that is built up on an individual capacity, a person with a great sense of financial understanding, who has built solid relationships with clients over the years within the financial services industry, uh, make sure that I had to put myself and stand uh, head and shoulders above the crowd. So speaking to the kind of needs that my clients have, how do I go beyond reading a script? How do I go beyond um, clients actually making assumptions as well that maybe one just reads a script or just uh, shows up in front of a laptop and in front of a camera and uh, conducts the program? That's when I had to realize the kind of value add that I do need to bring to the conversation and sharing that with my clients. So usually that goes into the background system of helping clients craft their conversations understanding what particular landing points we'd like to emphasize and making sure that I show that and emphasize that within the product end result of my work. Contracts, very important. Like me, many of you might uh, engage in uh, being a service provider and having moved from being a sole proprietor to then being an entrepreneur. And this is where anything that is put on paper is literally worth gold. As uh, an entrepreneur who uh, works within the realm of the speaking arena as well as media, uh, as mentioned, when the uh, line of income streams actually dried up in between March and April last year, this is certainly where a lot of contractual agreements helped me because either then agreements would be made to make sure that I do maintain the necessary cash flow that I need for my business by requesting a deposit before actually executing services and ensuring that clients are obligated to settle my invoices within a certain period of time, making sure that I don't suffer from any constraints regarding cash flow. Force majeure has also become a major theme and trend that many of us as entrepreneurs and business owners have become used to, whether it's the failure of being able to deliver goods and services or even the cancellation of events resulting in the lack of ability to execute your services. These are just some of the themes that have become so much more critical and important to incorporate into one's contract. And where I have good standing relationships with clients, what I also had to learn is, I guess, building a sense of flexibility to make sure that we maintain the positive relationship and where events have been able to be postponed, that we were able to negotiate how those particular fees and payment terms would be managed. That also brings me to the next point that I'd like to share, being money. Now, for anyone who's worked as a sole proprietor, specifically when it comes to the services space, one would know that it becomes slightly more difficult to actually have a product box or product tool where you say to clients, select product A or select product B, and this is the particular fee that it's for. During the pandemic and within the speaking space, again, it's one that isn't regulated. So essentially fees are charged based on how you as an individual or you as an entity view the value that it is that you bring to the table, and of course, meet the financial obligations that you'd like to fulfill within your operation. This unfortunately at times is fairly flexible because whether you're working with an agency, working independently, or working as someone who might have a few more accolades and levels of experience to your name, the objectives and the goalposts are very different for everyone. 
Again, I highlighted that social media has democratized access to this particular realm that I work in. So this also does mean that even for individuals who are new to the game and who have wanted to gain experience and build up a new revenue stream for themselves, this is where we also have lacked an alignment in terms of regulated fees and standard charges that should be applied. So not only building up on contracts, but making sure that from a fee point of view, you're very clear on what kind of fee structure one actually has within their operations. I think many of us are well aware that following the lockdown, many businesses found themselves under pressure and even sponsors, which I see is a question that has come up briefly. I'll be sure to address that towards the end. And that did raise a lot of questions in terms of having a COVID budget. Again, something quite important for entrepreneurs to be mindful of, because whilst you might be able to apply certain elements of discounts to your services and products, one does need to make sure that you're not completely off track just to keep revenue in place. However, that does not fulfill the further long-term profit targets that you actually have for your organization. And working within this particular media space, uh, as well as uh, being an entrepreneur who's a conversation strategist, this is often where I found a few learnings and some mishaps that even I had to overcome, that your revenue is not your profit. One needs to be very clear and very mindful of how you actually balance in um, the uh, operating expenses, the investments that you make, and of course, having the necessary cash flow available to upgrade any particular services and assets you need in your business to be able to execute these strategies online. From the data to the PC and the equipment, all of these called for quick access to cash flow and money and funding that's available to actually make sure that I could reinvest in my business to execute my, 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 my strategy going forward. So on that note, I do also want to wrap it up with what I've learned going forward and from the pandemic and lessons that I certainly hope will resonate with many, many more entrepreneurs, primarily those who might be transitioning from being sole proprietors to the world of being an entrepreneur, and of course, making sure that you follow through with the necessary processes to scale and build your business. One thing's for certain, as illustrated by the calculator on screen, is that it goes back to money. And this is where I learned the value of saving. Fortunately, as an entrepreneur who works with a very small team and uh, works with fellow entrepreneurs who uh, then would might be regarded as freelancers, or our, um, uh, members of the gig economy, we often collaborate on certain projects uh, and that has actually resulted in a cost saving on my end. So when the pandemic did hit and I did see a, a reduction within the revenue streams that I was anticipating, I did have a safety pot of emergency savings which stood me in good stead. Again, important for entrepreneurs to remember that the cash in your account does not translate into your savings. It's important to actually have separate pots with specific goals and objectives that you'd like to fulfill. So whether it's saving for any kind of tax um, that you might have to settle in future, whether it's saving for any emergency expenses that might have to come up within your business, or of course, any specific goals that might be related to scaling your business, that has proven to be quite important within the arena that I work in. Why I mentioned savings and not access to credit? Well, one thing's for sure is that when you work within the services space, it does become a lot more difficult for one to access credit, largely because financial institutions do need a sense of uh, suretyship and assets that they can lend against in order to make sure that you are essentially good for your money. So this is where I'd like to encourage entrepreneurs who work within the familiar media space that I delve into is to be mindful of the fact that because access to credit tends to be a little bit more difficult to gain, one does need to make sure that you're quite strict on making sure that you meet your savings targets. Cash flow. Who can forget cash flow? Well, of course, it's proven to be the key that has kept many businesses afloat and primarily for SMMEs in South Africa. If we reflect back on the fact that FinFind, one of the leading lenders to SMMEs in South Africa, towards the end of 2020 highlighted that at least 42% of businesses had closed down on the back of the pandemic and subsequent lockdown. Those numbers have highly likely increased considerably on the back of the SA looting as well as moving into the second quarter of 2021. But what this does show us is that essentially majority of entrepreneurs and small businesses in South Africa have struggled to survive because of a lack of cash flow. If more than half of entities in South Africa have been struggling, this tells us that we do need to adequately manage the cash flow. 
Now, a lot of the times banks do have a lot of software and tools and products and services available for us to access to manage that adequately. But I'd like to refer back to contracts where one does make sure that when it comes to your invoicing processes, comes to making sure that you follow through with the complete booking order process, one does have some strict protocols in place to make sure that either you're remunerated before an event takes place, or at least make sure you have some kind of deposit just to keep you going in terms of operational expenses. And then lastly, I definitely want to leave it off on value. Like for many of us, the pandemic has brought on about a great sense of anxiety and uncertainty and even imposter syndrome. As entrepreneurs, we look to build these particular businesses and why that's important is of course to make sure that we not only fulfill a mandate and meet the client's needs that we're trying to serve, but also making sure that we are providing solutions that are tangible to the clients that we want to address. This becomes very difficult when one has been pushed into the world of entrepreneurship because of being in dire financial straits. We've recently seen from a number of companies like Sunlam and Momentum that there's been an increased number of retrenchments taking place within South Africa's corporate environment. And that in itself has pushed many South Africans to move into the world of entrepreneurship as a means of survival. When you do that, you need to make sure that you back it up with great value. So purely understand what it is that you're starting, what your mandate is, and what solution you're trying to solve. Also, in a world where access to social media, to clients, to opportunities has been democratized by technology, it is something that we celebrate because we do need more entrepreneurs to, sit, to stimulate South Africa's economy. But one does need to find their sweet spot, the area that you specialize in, the kind of the the area that you are, um, are most advanced in in terms of your thinking, as well as the value and brand that you've been able to build to make sure that not only are you able to secure long-term relationships with clients, but you're able to differentiate the value offering that you provide versus some of your peers in the market. So on that note, I certainly hope that I've been able to give you a few concepts and ideas to be mindful of, and of course, perhaps to learn from as entrepreneurs, specifically within the services space, who not only want to make a profit, but also match their objectives to the passions that they're trying to drive and unleash, not only within themselves, but with the clients that they interact with. Gerald, I hope that that uh, was a, a, a solid, uh, a, a, I guess, feedback in terms of my experience and of course, some of the challenges that do remain. I am quite cognizant that on the upcoming months following the SA looting, that the pressure points might still be felt by many more entrepreneurs in South Africa. Well, awesome, awesome comments and awesome insight, Gugu. I think there's a lot of questions which you're going to have to address in a moment. But before we go there, we'd like to just recognize and do our usual roll call. You know, we do our roll call to make sure everyone is listening. Annalisa, we see you. Anna Marie, um, Babalwa, Anthony, um, Beryl Kay, Betty Dos Santos, you've been here in every webinar. Well done. Boy Tumelo, Brendan. Um, we see you, um, Bridget, Busisiwe. We can allow you to talk, by the way, if, you, if you're going to talk nice things, um, just let us know. We can give you um, a, an opportunity to also be seen. Carol, um, we see you. Um, and your first question, Google, is really this. Um, how important is a business plan? It's coming from Kayalak and Lovu. Google, how important is a business plan? At what stage did you write up your business plan and was it easy did you get startup capital or how did you get going i know you transitioned from being an employee to self-employed um did you have to get uh, startup funding how easy was it and the, the the question was also did you see yourself here was this part of the plan or it's kind of evolved Thanks for that, Mr. G. I think you're 100% spot on. Uh, there definitely has to be a vision. Uh, and even if that vision doesn't make full clarity or full sense, I don't even know where I want to be in the next 10 years, but I've got a pretty clear picture uh, of what kind of environment and where I'd like to be. But it's easier to break that down into nuggets, 12 months, six months, and activate that into specific targets that you can reach for yourself. And I was fortunate enough, like many South Africans, to be an employee uh, of recognized uh, companies in South Africa, which gave me the benefit and the comfort of a pension fund, of a salary, and of medical aid, which for many South Africans is actually a luxury, especially mm -hmm. if you're lucky enough to be employed in South Africa. So that did provide me with a backdrop in terms of managing not only my own personal finances, but at the time as a participant in the gig economy and getting ad hoc jobs that I was able to participate in that built up the reserve capital that I required in order to start up my business. 
The major challenge though on my end was the fact that I had to be mindful of the fact that in transitioning to entrepreneurship, my income would be a lot more erratic and I would need to have a solid business plan to understand where and how this does flow. But like many South Africans, being young, being ambitious, seeing a quick opportunity, I didn't start off with a business plan, but had to build and structure one up at least within a year of operating my business. Primarily because uh, what I've noticed within a lot of entrepreneurs who work within the services space where your, your value essentially lies within your, your intellectual capability, um, any talents or gifts that you might have and can't be structured and packaged into a box, you know, packaged away and then sent through uh, on a courier company, you really do need to apply yourself as to how you'll make sure that this business is um, sustainable. Primarily because it starts off as a one-man show where you are the CEO, you are the individual conducting the work itself, the marketing director, and of course, um, the manager of finances and bookings. But you also need to make sure that you at some point bring certain people on board to make sure that you're able to scale and grow your business in an adequate manner. And that also speaks to the various partnerships that one has been able to establish with a variety of not only standing clients, but of course, other peers and members of the media um, who then collaborate on certain projects like consultants ordinarily would do, and then move on to build a portfolio of work that would then speak for itself. So definitely where you can try to save, I know it's very difficult for South Africans to uh, either access credit or build up enough capital, but where you can start with your own pocket or even build a sense of community. Um, one thing we often don't talk about often uh, and was addressed in the previous webinar was uh, informal savings through stock files. And whether we call them investment clubs or our own little stock files, um, there's an opportunity there to network with people who are like-minded and who are more than happy just to provide you with, I guess, um, um, investment capital just to get started within the operations you'd like to establish. I think you've, 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 you've touched on an important point, which you also came out last week. If you are that small in business or entrepreneur, look at your local economy. The most small business start with support from friends and family. And also that's where you get the endorse endorsement in some instances that your, your product is viable. Obviously, um, Google also spoke on the fact that she is the business. So it's important, we're going to touch on that in terms of the insurance side, because if you are sick and you are the business, how do you recover from that? So we're gonna talk about that. Annalisa, um, I see you, you asked that question. Mahlodi and Ellen, you're asking more or less the same question. Um, how do you grow your clientele, you know? So Mahlodi and Ellen have got that side hustle, but they're struggling to, to grow it. Um, is it always important to grow the side hustle or is it okay to stay in your main job? Because um, obviously you have peers who've watched you and who you started off with who sometimes are still in mainstream employment. Is the side hustle for everyone? Um, how do you grow, grow your clients or make your, your value proposition more attractive? And um, let's take those questions and then we'll go to the next speaker and then we'll re-engage at the end of the session so that everyone gets an opportunity to, to hear all three speakers. Fantastic, thank you so much for that, Mr. G. I guess starting off with uh, whether or not to build a side hustle. Money, business, relationships, health, all of those are personal themes and I guess go back to what you want to achieve as an individual. There are some side hustles which have proven to be incredibly viable to build and establish as uh, ongoing businesses which become self-sustainable in the long term. And when you work within the services space, sometimes this can be difficult because um, um, you, again, as mentioned, are fundamentally executing the role and the services that are required. So I would say you do need to reflect if your side hustle works for you or if you prefer um, other means of employment. And if so, how you mitigate against any risk of losing one or any other source of uh, revenue. Because one thing we certainly have all learned, especially during the, this pandemic, is that multiple streams of income is very important. And there are various ways to actually stimulate multiple streams of income with or without um, a side hustle. Secondly, I do think that if you uh, do choose to, to, to grow your side hustle, um, one does need to be uh, cognizant of the environment that you're in. And as a speaker or one who might have an opportunity to collaborate with large corporates and assist them with their strategies, Number one, if you wanna get involved, make sure you've got skin in the game. So ordinarily for many individuals within the services space, we start out doing work for free. 
whether you're a photographer, whether you're someone who writes for particular magazines or wants to write a book, but we often do the first few gigs for free or at an incredibly discounted rate, because what you'd like to build is the exposure and the credibility. That same exposure and credibility can then be used um, as a, a method of profiling your business and also feedback that can build in terms of building your credibility within the industry. Once you've established a great sense of credibility, I was fortunate enough to do that through the media companies that I worked with and engaging with a number of representatives that then allowed me to go into the environment, understanding what my value is, understanding how to structure my contract, and of course, um, packaging my business to actually understand um, the uh, revenue goals and objectives that I have and how we would scale this particular business. Building relationships and maintaining them definitely goes back to a one-on-one -on -one relationship. You're only as good as your last gig is what they say. So when you do have an engagement with a corporate client, it's very important to follow back, follow up rather, solicit some kind of feedback, as well as understand what it is that you can work on. Or even better yet, often engage with your clients to further understand what more do they need or what do they feel that they didn't require um, within pre previous conversations. But when you approach with the conversation or engagement with your clients, always looking to provide them with solutions and not pushing a sale, that's often where number one, you build a sustainable relationship. And number two, you're able to identify new avenues of actually generating a revenue stream with current clients, instead of constantly having to change, chase new clients uh, and new um, um, environments to serve, work with what you've got, nurture those relationships. And what you'll find is that over time, there'll be a consistency as a result of the amount of work that you do. But always remember to back it up with the hard work that's required because you are really only as good as your last gig. Awesome, Gugu. So you're only as good as your last gig. Now, I forgot to do your bio at your intro. So you can see Gugu is a natural and it's not by accident that we all are glued to the screen and waiting for what next is she going to say because she's a well-versed speaker and she's a broadcaster and she's got experience in the camera and behind the mic and addresses many audiences of different sizes. This skill, together with her grasp of financial markets, economic data, and current affairs, has led her to host one of the most popular shows on radio, business shows on radio, which is Kaya Biz. So this makes her a popular speaker across the continent. And this forms the basis of her tasks and responsibilities as a senior anchor on CNBC Africa and Google serves as a conference chair, panel discussion moderator, and program director, director at various industry gatherings that impact business and the investment landscape. I saw a comment on the question that says, we wish we can have you for three hours. Google, she'll give you her address. You can book her. Don't do anything for flea. No more flea things. Please, <laughs> let's do things for remuneration. I like that point as well because... You know, sometimes when you're in the gig economy, you want this exposure, but you need to know when to draw the line between I'm looking for exposure or and I am a brand now. You need to start paying for me. But we'll go back to that at the end. Um, Google, please don't run away. Um, we'll try and get everyone out by four, four o'clock. But let's move on to our next speaker, who is the head of savings and investments for relationship banking at APSA. APSA are the partner for SASI for July Savings Month. And Hilary Mangwana is our next speaker. He holds an MBA and a BSc Honours Electrical Engineering degree from the University of Zimbabwe. And in addition, Hilary has completed a number of executive development programs, including the Strategic Investment Management Program at the London Business School and the Africa Integrated Leadership Development Program, offered jointly by Duke University and the Barclays Africa Group. Hillary has over 20 years banking experience, gained in various roles in structured debt finance, leasing, and asset-based finance, corporate, governance, corporate coverage, and investments and liquidity management. Now, any small business will tell you the next decision you make from deciding to become an entrepreneur is to find a banking partner and manage your money. Before Hillary comes on stage, we'll be having a short video from APSA Business Banking, and Hillary, over to you. It is tailor-made for my business. Can I accept payments easily? Can I do my business banking any time of the day? Wherever I am. 
open a business evolve account online and get all this plus free cash flow manager an integrated accounting tool we do more so you can that's africanacity over to you hillary thanks uh, th thanks gerald um uh, and thanks uh, to C. um also thanks to google for that very inspirational um uh, presentation. Uh, I'm not going to try and, uh, and match that standard, but certainly uh, we'll use some of uh, the insights as the basis for, for the next discussion. Uh, I'm going to try and share a presentation, uh, some slides to go through, um, and uh, we'll take questions at the end. Just let me know if you can uh, if you can all see that uh, that presentation that I'm sharing. We can. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. So I think uh, Google covered quite a lot of uh, uh, key points on entrepreneurship. Uh, I'm not going to uh, repeat some of those uh, key key issues. Otherwise, I'm going to spoil. Uh, I think the message. But I want to zero in on. Uh, some of the very practical tools that we can use as entrepreneurs to manage uh, our financial environment, specifically around cash management, cash flow management, as well as saving uh, in the business uh, for future requirements. Now, <clears throat> for entrepreneurs, uh, we know that uh, the environment has probably never been uh, more challenging uh, than what we currently see. Uh, and uh, that's just a summary of uh, our operating environment uh, in 2021. Uh, we have had uh, over 16 months uh, of lockdowns, which has meant that uh, a lot of businesses have not been able to operate uh, physically. Uh, some have had to go virtual, but we know that a lot of entrepreneurs uh, were not able to, to operate in the normal course of business. Uh, we have the perennial uh, load shedding uh, issues, uh, power being unreliable, which also puts quite a lot of strain on our businesses. Uh, we have heard about the macroeconomic environment, um, uh, the crisis that we are in uh, as far as GDP growth uh, is concerned. Uh, and this didn't start with, uh, with COVID. Uh, prior to COVID, we were already experiencing some strain uh, in the economy. Um, the events of last week, um, uh, I think uh, I need not say more, but uh, the trauma that is caused uh, and of course the strain uh, that it has caused to entrepreneurs and small businesses. Uh, and of course the loss of lives uh, that we have seen. I think uh, that number that's being reflected there, uh, we have since learned that it has actually more than doubled uh, from uh, where we were uh, about a week ago. So I think this presents uh, such, a, such a challenge uh, for anyone that's uh, an entrepreneur or anyone that uh, is uh, planning to become uh, an entrepreneur. The question is, how do we navigate uh, all this? It's just such a lot uh, of issues that one has to deal with. Um, I think the most important thing uh, for me uh, is to emphasize that uh, in all this uh, doom and gloom, um, uh, there is always help and uh, there is always hope uh, for businesses. Uh, this could actually be the start uh, of uh, uh, key opportunities coming into, into our businesses uh, if we are able to leverage uh, of uh, all the various uh, factors and opportunities that come uh, our way. Uh, I'm going to focus on uh, a few things uh, that I think are critical from a financial point of view. The first one being the need to have good financial partners uh, in a time like this. Now, I think traditionally we've looked at financial partners uh, or banks uh, is just uh, uh, partners that allow us to uh, bank our funds, that allow us to open transactional accounts, uh, that allow us to, to get the basic services. I think beyond that, uh, there is now a need to look at uh, these financial partners uh, as trusted and reliable advisors. And I'm going to uh, explain more uh, around that, but it's just important 
uh, to emphasize that we are no longer talking of a bank client relationship, but actually that relationship between an entrepreneur and, uh, and a trusted, trusted and reliable advisor. Um, we also need financial partners with expertise and capacity to, to assist us. Uh, and uh, I think most importantly, uh, given that uh, as entrepreneurs we are busy, uh, there is that need to almost have what we could call one-stop shops, where I don't have to go and do my banking here, I go somewhere else to do my insurance, I go elsewhere to do uh, my, uh, I mean, to get financial advice, I go and do investments elsewhere, and uh, perhaps my tax uh, and uh, accounting issues are handled by another entity. All this could be provided uh, in a one-stop shop if we choose the right partners. I think the second uh, thing is that we obviously need the right tools uh, to manage our finances and our businesses. And again, uh, the need to leverage uh, the banking platforms that we are exposed to uh, or the banking platforms of our partners is very, very critical. And that is what will help us manage some of the costs uh, in our businesses. It's also important uh, to note that uh, we could actually use our banks as free consultants and mentors uh, without having to go to other third parties uh, for these uh, additional services. But however, also important to note that uh, a lot of these uh, uh, services uh, and tools that uh, uh, our banking partners provide are uh, always uh, available on a digital uh, sort of platform. This is the in thing. Uh, so as entrepreneurs, we are actually compelled to be, to be techno savvy because a lot of the services that we will be getting from our financial institutions are delivered through digital or through online, uh, online platforms. Again, we are going to talk more about that. Then of course, a uh, critical thing is uh, cash, flow, uh, cash flow management in the business. Uh, we'll talk about it again uh, in a lot more detail. Um, managing your business risks, uh, that's uh, very critical. Uh, your banking partners can help you identify and mitigate all the financial risks uh, in your business. I think for me, what's important uh, is to emphasize that uh, uh, all the excess cash in our business, uh, we do not need to put it at risk, uh, just in search of, uh, of high returns or high yields, particularly now in a low interest rate environment. It's very, very important to ensure that uh, our capital, our cash flows are highly protected. Then the assets in the business uh, must be adequately insured. I think Gerald is going to talk uh, more about uh, business insurance. Now let's go to some of the tools uh, that we feel small businesses and entrepreneurs can uh, leverage off their financial institutions. And I'm going to go first uh, to the theme that you saw in the ad uh, that was shown. Um, and this talks to having versatile bank accounts. Now, uh, the ad that you show showed you an account called Business Evolve, which is essentially a bank account that evolves as your business also evolves. So as your business grows, uh, as your business goes through various stages, that, are, that bank account allows you to, to manage uh, your business uh, accordingly. Now, this is a digitally enabled uh, basic transactional account, um, uh, but that comes with a number of uh, free business tools. And let's look at some of those tools. Uh, you get a debit card uh, and an embedded savings or investment account without having to open one. The moment you have a business Evolve account, which you open online, you automatically have a debit card and you have uh, an embedded savings account, which pays you a competitive interest rate. In addition, uh, there's something called cash flow manager, which is a free accounting tool. Um, and it's also a free business tool, business management tool uh, that comes in at no additional cost. Um, this will, of course, help you uh, save on bank charges, accounting software costs, and of course, bookkeepers costs. I think uh, what's also important to emphasize is that uh, this is a very easy to use uh, tool. Uh, it plugs into your digital banking platform, um, and therefore there are no further costs that are involved in uh, configuration or uh, mapping it to your, uh, to your business. Um, 
Also important is that there's free support and training uh, that is offered. I think what I can emphasize uh, also is that uh, in addition to getting all these free tools, uh, this business evolve allows the bank to fully understand uh, the client's business operations, uh, where they are uh, in their business cycles, the cash flow cycles, and so on and so forth. And uh, the bank can then determine uh, when to advance facilities. So be it uh, working capital requirements, be it uh, term lending requirements, be it loans or whatever it is, the bank is actually able to predict uh, that my client now requires uh, some, uh, uh, so, so some lending facilities. I'm going to move on to managing surplus cash. I think uh, the most important thing is that uh, uh, we don't just pack uh, excess cash in our business uh, into check accounts. Uh, banks or good banks will provide you with uh, uh, proper savings and investment accounts that give you an actual return uh, on your surplus cash and not a zero or 0.1% uh, interest rate. So it's very important to ensure that you are getting value uh, from your excess cash. Of course, uh, the investment has to be within tolerable limits in terms of uh, uh, operational risks uh, and capital risks that the bank, I mean, that the client uh, uh, requires. But in most cases, all our bank accounts come with no uh, capital risks. Your capital is guaranteed. The interest that is quoted is also guaranteed. Also important is to ensure that uh, the surplus cash meets your liquidity needs. In other words, as and when you need uh, to utilize cash flows, you must have access to that, uh, to that investment and not wait uh, for a period of time uh, before you can uh, access uh, the cash. Uh, another important thing uh, is the minimization of working capital costs. Um, I think very few clients, especially small businesses, um, realize that uh, if you have got multiple uh, bank accounts, for instance, uh, one is in surplus in terms of cash, the other one, the other one is in overdraft, uh, they are actually opportunities to offset uh, one against, uh, against the other. So the interest that you pay on an overdraft uh, facility can actually be offset against uh, the surplus funds that are sitting uh, in your investment or savings accounts. Now, this is something that uh, every good bank uh, should be able to do for you uh, without uh, necessarily charging any, uh, any costs. Then I think one thing that we have realized is uh, given the current um, environment that we are in, um, uh, the tough local environment, um, uh, some small uh, businesses are starting to see uh, opportunities across our borders. Uh, and I think what's important to, to note is that uh, your bank uh, will always be there to provide you with comprehensive uh, international banking solutions. Uh, there's no need uh, for small businesses to worry about the financial complexities of cross-border trading uh, managing foreign currency risks and so on and so forth. All of that can be taken care of uh, by, your, uh, by, by your banking partner, uh, regardless of how small your business is, and also regardless of how small the uh, international banking uh, or trade opportunity is. Uh, some of the key components uh, that uh, a good bank should be able to offer you uh, include things like uh, comprehensive trade and payment solutions, uh, including things like uh, letters of credit, site documents, and so on and so forth. Uh, competitive foreign currency solutions, uh, including the hedging of any foreign currency risks, uh, the managing of uh, exchange control uh, issues, uh, advisory services on, uh, on all XCON uh, issues, uh, also opening up of uh, uh, foreign currency accounts. Uh, you can open accounts in uh, all the major currencies, uh, and it will be a local uh, bank account, uh, either in dollars, euros, pound, or so on and so forth. Uh, all that can be done by your, by your domestic bank. And of course, uh, uh, provision of uh, international uh, travel solutions. So all those uh, 
solutions are available. Uh, they are not the preserve of, uh, of big corporates. Uh, and in fact, I think uh, a lot of our small businesses feel that uh, uh, importing and exporting is the preserve of, uh, of large businesses. Contrary to that, anyone uh, should be able to do that and at very minimal cost uh, if you yeah, seek the services of your banking partner to manage all the complex uh, financial uh, yeah, issues and uh, transactions. Um, the other question that uh, normally comes up uh, is, uh, should I be saving uh, or should I be investing? Uh, and uh, I think uh, the short answer is uh, uh, for a small business or for any business for that matter, you should always be doing both. And uh, perhaps uh, sometimes the confusion comes in uh, what is saving and uh, uh, how different is it from, uh, from investing? I think uh, without uh, specifically answering uh, that, uh, that question, uh, uh, what I have attempted to do there is to just give you a horizon uh, in terms of uh, how we should be managing uh, the cash uh, in our business and uh, where we should be placing cash depending on what uh, our horizon is and also what our intentions and objectives are. Uh, in short, uh, we save by putting money aside uh, so that it can take care of uh, either foreseen or unforeseen uh, requirements. Usually when we save, we are not too concerned about what uh, the return is going to be because uh, we are going to be utilizing the funds uh, within a short space, uh, space of time. So what you see on the left-hand side uh, the various tools that can be used for saving, which are mainly your check accounts, your call accounts, and other such as savings uh, sort of uh, products. And this is meant for uh, your short-term, very short-term funds, what we call overnight funds, and that's to manage operating cash in the business, cash that we will need uh, to utilize uh, within a short space of time. If we uh, open up the horizon and we start looking at uh, perhaps uh, two weeks to three months to six months, we then move into what we call tactical or reserve cash. And uh, in that space, we want to earn uh, a little bit of return higher than uh, what we would get in call accounts, which are available on, uh, on demand. And that's where things like notice deposits and money market accounts uh, come in. Uh, we call those short-term to medium-term uh, funds. The interest rate end uh, will be slightly higher than what we get on, uh, on our call accounts and uh, on our check accounts. When it comes to long-term uh, uh, cash management, we are now talking of uh, investing. And uh, this is now uh, man the management of strategic cash uh, in the horizon uh, is slightly longer than the, say, six months. And that's where we go into uh, riskier assets uh, although we can start with uh, long-term uh, deposits or fixed deposits, which will pay us uh, slightly higher interest, uh, interest rates than uh, money market funds. But uh, if we really want to earn higher returns, uh, we need to take a little bit, uh, perhaps more risk in terms of capital, in terms of liquidity uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, then comes in other uh, sort of uh, asset uh, classes, other investment products. Uh, that's where you get things like equities, fixed income uh, products, exchange traded funds, and so on and so forth. And I would say for that, you really need uh, your specialists uh, to help you uh, navigate that space. But when it comes to your overnight funds, short-term uh, to medium-term uh, cash management, your bankers will always be able to, uh, to assist you with that. I think uh, we have covered uh, most of the uh, most of the issues that I wanted to go through, and I'm also uh, conscious uh, conscious of time. Um, I think I'll leave you with uh, perhaps some uh, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, clips on uh, uh, cash cash management, the importance of cash management. I think Google spoke about uh, about that that. Uh, your revenue or turnover is not equal to uh, profit. And that profit is also not equal to 
uh, to cash flow. Cash flow is ultimately what keeps uh, a business uh, uh, in survival. And uh, that's uh, what we call the lifeblood uh, of any business. If there's no positive cash flows, a business, a business cannot, uh, cannot survive. Uh, I mean, you've heard that uh, cash is king uh, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, some say turnover is vanity, profit is sanity, but cash is the, is the real king. But actually what we mean by cash, we are actually talking of cash flow. It is positive cash flow that keeps uh, up, a, up a business uh, are running. I think important to emphasize uh, yeah, during this savings month that uh, it starts with putting some money aside uh, in the business, whatever positive uh, cash flows are generated. It starts uh, by putting them aside uh, in order to cater for future, future requirements. But ultimately what's required uh, is to partner with a competent uh, financial institution that can help you navigate uh, all these other complexities and ensure that uh, the business uh, stays, uh, stays afloat. Uh, I'm gonna pause there uh, and uh, check if there are any, uh, any questions. Thank you very much, Hilary. I think your, 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 your presentation is, is perhaps the most important. What I was glad to hear is that your bank actually offers training for the free software because more than often than not, you get the free, free software and you don't know where to start. So perhaps if you can share either on the chat or um, how uh, APSA clients can actually access that free training because that could be a game changer um, in terms of accessing the tools. Because I want a tool which will do my, my management accounts, which can show me my liquidity and cash flow so I can become a better small business um, manager. Now, you can never run away from this question. As long as that brand is behind you, every small business person is going to ask you this. How can I increase my chance of getting access to capital from my bank? Most small businesses, they put their money into their bank accounts and religiously work with their bank only in the day of need to apply and be told no. How can one increase their chances of getting funding when it's needed from their bank? And that question is, uh, has been asked a few times. Yeah, look, I think that's, uh, that's a very fair question and a very critical uh, question. I think I mentioned uh, in one of the on one of the slides that uh, with um, our business Evolve account, uh, we are able to actually anticipate when uh, a client will need to have uh, facilities, uh, particularly working capital facilities from the bank we are able to help them focus uh, their cash flows and provide overdrafts as and when, as and when required. Um, I think the uh, second aspect of that is, uh, uh, it's not always the case that uh, the bank knows what I'm thinking as a business uh, person. There are times when I have seen an opportunity and I actually want to uh, go and borrow. How do I go about that? Uh, I think once again, um, rather than just, uh, putting up uh, an application, I think it's very important to be very clear uh, what the purpose of the funding is. Uh, of course, the business case behind it, um, uh, cash flow focused uh, behind, uh, behind that, uh, that requirement. And I would say, uh, most importantly, uh, speak uh, to your banker rather than just uh, perhaps walk into a branch and say, I need uh, a, a loan for this and that. I would say speak uh, to a banker because a banker is able to actually comprehend what you are putting together. And when I say when I say a banker, I mean uh, a business banker. But I think uh, things will always vary from uh, from client to client, uh, from industry to industry. Uh, there are times when uh, the no is actually a very good no because uh, you might be seeing an opportunity uh, which could. Uh, ultimately not materialize and you end up with a loan that you are not able to, uh, to, 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 to service. So I would say uh, a conversation with your business banker is, uh, is very, very important before you actually take uh, that form uh, and fill up uh, to apply for a loan. Okay, thank you on that one. So the other question is really around the COVID financing 
facility. I mean, the media has been awash with information that the government um, released COVID funds to, to the banks. How easy is it to access that money? And um, is there a set criteria or is it just the standard lending criteria to access COVID funding? That's another question from the panel, from the yeah, look, to, to be quite honest, I'm not an expert uh, on that, but uh, I mean, the truth is that uh, we had uh, the funding available, uh, particularly during last year. Um, I think the uh, biggest issue was that uh, the take up was a lot lower um, than, was, expe than was, was expected. So the funding was available, but uh, the number of applications for people requiring uh, that COVID relief uh, were actually lower than was anticipated. I think uh, I, I would be quite keen to take um, uh, the details uh, of uh, uh, the business that's asking for that and then uh, pass it on to the relevant uh, sort of uh, uh, people that can actually assist directly with that. Hey, thank you, Hillary. So Let's move on. Um, we'll have questions at the end. We're trying to get everyone out by 4 p.m. So that means that I need to get on to my presentation and I'll be talking, putting on my other hat as a certified financial planning professional on insurance. And they need the importance of insurance for a small business. And um, that has come more to the fore or that's become more important now in that uh, we've seen what's been going on in South Africa and the challenges the country has faced um, with the looting, et cetera. So a lot of small businesses have been asking, you know, um, what could they do or how do they get, should they have insurance for business? So we're going to talk and, and discuss a few things around business insurance, especially for a small business and entrepreneur, a sole proprietorship, it doesn't matter. It's you, you're self-employed you are the one who makes those decisions. So what we're going to cover in, the, in, in this brief slideshow is we're going to try and identify the types of insurance you need for your small business. Remember, your small business sometimes is based on the provision of a service where you are the engine, where you are the business, you are the brand. You know, So typically service uh, uh, driven businesses are the professionals. Um, or sometimes your small business is driven by product, which means you're manufacturing and you're producing uh, something which people can touch, feel, sometimes taste. Um, you need to identify the types of insurance you might be needing. And we'll also try and explain why insurance is simply important um, for your small business. Now, there's six key areas you need to ask yourself around why or how or if my small business requires insurance. Um, the first one is um, what kind of insurances your business may require. We're going to kind of go into that. The other types of insurance, we'll go into that. But you need to ask yourself, what are the reasons I need insurance? And the main reason you need insurance is simply you, life happens. Insurance is really uh, cover or protection against a, an event that can occur in the future, which can destabilize either you, your business, um, or your income, or even you, it can hurt others. Because another reason you simply need insurance is so that you don't hurt other people and have lawsuits uh, coming your way. There's location-related con considerations. There are some locations where you need insurance. And dare I say, after what we've witnessed in the last two weeks in South Africa, you can see certain locations are higher risk than others. Should your business be operating in that location, insurance becomes a higher priority for you. You need to select your policy, your agency or your agent will go that right, discuss that right at the end and what to do once you've secured your insurance. Now, the first type of insurance I'm going to talk about is the insurance you have to have. There's some things you which are mandatory. You need to have insurance to compensate third parties. They call it third party insurance. So like your motor vehicle, if you cause an accident, you need to be able to repair um, or compensate the person who, whose vehicle you might damage or a person whose life you might harm or injure. Okay, so first thing there's mandatory types of insurance 
um, which ensure which you need to have so that you know you you basically are in a position where you you don't end up with liabilities um, which arise from there. There's now a new type of insurance you need, which is around social media and um, liabilities which arise from social media. As much as we all love social media and it's a great marketing tool, you need to have insurance against perhaps statements you make or misinformation which you might divulge on social media. So you might make a mistake and uh, type the wrong price, miss out a zero on your service offering or your product. Unfortunately, because it's legally binding a lot of the time, you're going to have to sell it at that price. These are some of the things you need to realize that social media is not a playground. It's, 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 it's serious business, especially when you start talking to your clients through it. Um, you need to be able, also have mandatory insurance against the losses from cyber attack. I mean, um, we saw, I think it was Liberty Life a year or a year or two ago were ransomed when someone got access to their database and they had to pay Bitcoin um, to, 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 to be released from the clutches of the criminals who managed to get hold of the da that database. Similarly, you and your small business must realize you have a legal responsibility on the information which you keep for your clients. So for example, your client's information with the Poppy Act, which came into um, full force the beginning of this month, you can't lose your client's details. It's not okay to just say, ah, sorry guys, life happens, I lost my PC, I lost my laptop. No, it doesn't work like that. Um, you can actually end up with serious liability. So cyber insurance, you need to have it now, um, specifically for that purpose. And then the other mandatory insurance is around workers' compensation and personal injury. If I'm on your premises and I fall, I need to know that I'm protected. You need to have that personal injury um, insurance. Same thing with your workers. If they are using a, a power tool and something happens, you need to be able to compensate them. Um, and obviously there are state um, insurances which are available, which you need to subscribe to, but also you can have your own additional private policies around those things. If you are a service provider where perhaps you are the intellectual capital, you're giving advice. You need to realize you need to have professional indemnity. Um, no one is perfect. Um, no doctor is perfect. No financial planning professional is perfect. No accountant is perfect. You make a mistake. And sometimes your mistake costs someone else money. And you need to have professional indemnity insurance so that you're covered for those mistakes. You don't go out to make mistakes, but because you are the engine of the business, you are the, you are the mastermind, you are the key person there, you need to be insured. Because on a bad day, you can give bad advice or perhaps you are simply misinformed. You don't know everything. So as a professional, you, you shouldn't be stepping out without um, professional indemnity insurance. In many instances, professional bodies require you to have it, but make sure it's, it's something you have. And, and now, all these insurances can work for you as well, by the way. When you sit with the client, show them your professional indemnity insurance. Tell them, you know what? I've got professional indemnity insurance, 20 million rand. If anything goes wrong with the advice I'm giving you, we're sorted. It also builds trust for you. So there's a marketing angle. You can't always be crying about I'm paying insurance. No, market it. Bring that policy with you on your client meeting. This is our professional indemnity. We, will, we are protected for you. And it also helps um, in terms of of, of, your, of your general um, marketing. There's general liability insurance, which is around um, you know, any liabilities which come towards your business. Um, and also there's what they call directors and officers liability. Many small businesses have been brought down by people within the business. So sometimes you don't know that in your business, you've got someone in there who's actually working against the flow. Fraud, big, big business risk. And many small businesses do not see it as a risk, but the moment there's a second person in your business, it's a risk because life happens. Um, you know, I, I personally experienced it. Someone I trusted, I employed them. I did reference checks. They were, they were the right person for the job. Hey, 
When it came to they having hardship in their house, they did stuff, became my problem. If you are the business owner, the liability will end up with you. So have that director, directors and officers liability going. Google spoke about this. She is the key person. So um, I don't know if you thought about it, GU, GU, because if you are booked for a gig <laughs> and God forbid something happens and you can't make it, who do you send? Who covers for you? You can't say, I'm sorry, guys, I'm not feeling well. Like, uh, 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 uh. I'm going to try to keep the bag in your, in, your, in your company. So perhaps you need to have a network of top MCs where you say, in the event of me not making it, so-and-so will appear. And in your contract, you have it there so that the clients are also comfortable knowing that Google is top, top shy like here. If she's not there, we get this one and get that one. Ah, business. And again, it's about marketing yourselves because it's those networks which she was talking about saying freelancers must um, build a network. Because by having that network with other top MCs, they are all protecting their businesses because it means that now they almost get books together all the time because you're, you're now aligning yourselves. But be careful again, who you align with because that's a risk in itself. But as a key person in your business, even if you're making um, goods or you're an accountant and you can't work, you need to have a person nominated who can do your work for even an extended period of time. What key person insurance does is they take money and they pay that person a market related rate to do your work. But it means your company doesn't fold, especially if you are the brain's trust. So I want you right now to think about that. Who is the person you would put in your network? Google, it's okay. I will call you at the end. Um, listen, list who also would take over your business in the event of um, something happening to you. Most of you are setting up businesses for a legacy. You do your business because you've got Tingan, you've got children. They're all over the place. Mine are somewhere they might pop up anytime in the background, but that's the reason we work. So you need to have a plan if anything should happen to you um, around your death. We'll, we'll cover that on the last slide as well. And you need to have that plan, especially where there's a partnership. Because in your partnership, you now introduce your business to having two people, from having two people potentially to having four people. Because if you have a spouse and they have a spouse, you may think you're running the business, the two of you know, there's four of you in that business. And should anything happen to your partner, the partner can come and say, you know what, I don't want anything to do this business. I want cash. Give me the cash. My husband's cash. I want it. You know, <laughs> he's a businessman. And then you're like, no, we're tied up with assets. Hillary, uh, we've got call accounts. This money is operational. Uh -uh. Those shares, be careful. Once there's a partnership, there's a specific business insurance you have to have called the buy and sell policy. And the way that policy works is in the event of one of you dying, the insurance policy pays out to the business so that you can buy out the partner and you can continue to have your livelihood. Otherwise, in many instances, partnerships, partners disappearing has often meant the end of the business, okay? So important, trustee uh, named to administer or liquidate assets. This is serious stuff. You must realize that especially if you're a small business, you're, you are the business. Yes, the PTY or PVT or whatever you want to call it, but it's you. So you need to realize that your personal financial planning must be aligned to your business because those two are, cannot be separated. You're not yet a JSC company where there's shareholders. It's you, it's just you. And you need to have a plan for yourself. Now, what are we gonna do next? Because I'm trying to get us out by four o'clock, so it's moving fast, but we'll take questions. You need to ask yourself about your professional indemnity insurances. Do you have those types of insurance? And then there's insurance also, you need to look at protection for your lenders and your investors. Hey, the bank, they're your best friend when they're giving you cash. Have you ever seen a bank when they want their money? Yo, oh, it's different. They are not your best friends anymore. They forget about the lunch they took you on to take the money. They want their money back. So it's important have those credit life insurances. And these are specific insurance policies. When you take out a loan, insure it because life happens, COVID happens. 
you know, um, a lot of businesses cannot go to the bank right now and say life has happened, hey, COVID, the whole country, not my fault. No, 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 no. You signed for that loan, pay back the money. So have a policy in place to protect you. Another one we've learned about this week, Sasria, Google spoke about it. Disasters, liability, loss of income, things happen, riots, and it's not your fault. Yes, we understand it's not your fault, but do you have it? Because if you don't have it, it means you can watch your business literally go up in flames. And that's what's happened, unfortunately, for a vast number of small businesses who probably will never recover. And it's important. Now, in the same vein, you can have a policy for your staff, uh, salaries, et cetera. So when you look at a big business and you look at the insurance amounts they pay in premiums, they're scary numbers. And it's the real reason behind that is because they see all these as a risk. Now, unfortunately, you don't have a risk or compliance officer to help you. But hopefully, I'm opening your eyes to realize that it's not puff and place just waking up and saying, I am the business. There's a lot of things you need to take into consideration um, with regards to your work. Important thing, do a beauty contest. Don't go to the first financial professional who you talk to, even if you like me. Go talk to, other, to another person and, and get advice which works for you. It then ties us back to our theme this year, which is saving in your language. Speak to someone who speaks your language. And your language cannot necessarily be uh, as an English or Zulu. it can just be a language in terms of the vibe, the energy, the understanding. This person is with my business. We're going places together because unfortunately, none of this insurance stuff is going to work on Google. Don't try Dr. Google. You're not going to get information. Insurance, you really need to sit down with someone who understands it because insurance is all about the insurance policy. And if you've ever seen an insurance policy, it's an entire policy, an entire contract in small print. And, and there's always a point one, two, 25, which they can decide they're not gonna pay you because of. So you need to work with a professional, especially when you're talking around insurance. Um, but most importantly, I think I'm gonna take out, leave you this take out, price the cost of insurance into your, into your business. So when you do that quote, when you price your, your, your teacup or whatever you're selling or yourself, price it in, it's necessary. You are the key person, you need that insurance. Make it a key, a fundamental operational cost. It's almost as important as, it is important as your ingredients, you need it. And as I spoke before, if you have business partners, your, your, your business partner, your, it's, it's like you've gone into a relationship, marriage, because it's the same implication when things go wrong within the business um, if you don't have the right protection against your partner. I can't say that. Now. You can't have right insurance. <laughs> okay, and then lastly, your personal life policies. You can't, you can't divorce yourself from your business. You can't have insurance or protection for your assets in your business and not protect the greatest asset, which is you. So you need to start from a bottom-up approach. Your personal life insurance needs to cover yourself, your family, your liabilities as an individual, and then you layer it up onto the business as well. So be careful. Don't rush into entrepreneurship, if, especially if you're doing high-risk work where things can go wrong or mistakes um, do happen. So I want you to clarify your intention. I want to be an entrepreneur. I'm the sole proprietor. Put attention to your intention. I want to do this thing. I'm going to get help. I'm going to get someone who can help me be the person I want to be. I can do this. Yeah, but 89% of the entrepreneurs fail, but yeah, you can do this. We can do this. You know, you have to go in there with confidence. There's no entrepreneur who ever started going planning on failing. And then lastly, you can have it. You can have it all. And it's possible. But the nice thing about having seasoned entrepreneurs like um, we got from Google earlier is that she's told you it's a journey, eh? She didn't, she didn't give us a timeline, but maybe Google, as we open the floor up to anyone now who wants to ask questions as we close, give us a timeline as to appreciating how long it took before everyone saw you on Kaya Biz. Where, what did Google have to go through the toil? You know, that, you know, I think everyone sees your name in light 
and they think last year you decided to go in Kaya Biz <laughs> and, and, and come out on TV. But no, I think my first interview with Google was probably around 2016, 2015. She was already up there, but it takes time. And I think that's one of the important considerations for entrepreneurs, time. I wanted to talk about where you can get your money as entrepreneurs, but we don't have time for that right now. But stock bells, stop crying and saying the bank is my only source. If your own family and your own friends don't have confidence in your concept, start questioning it because they are the closest people around you and often can tell you if you've got a good product or not. So Google, what's the timeline? How did it happen? Did you magically wake up? Um, okay, if I can get myself to unshare the thing. Okay. Um, did, did you suddenly wake up one day and say, I'm going on Kaya Biz and CNBC? How long did it take from Google, the individual, to Google, the CEO? And it, is, let's just appreciate the time. And then any questions, I'm gonna go into the questions now. Fantastic. I'll be sure to keep it brief, Mr. G, but you are quite right. I really do wish that all these things happened overnight, right? But hardly so. Um, like many South Africans, I entered into the working force environment back in 2010, where all I wanted was a full-time job. By the time I sat down with you uh, uh, for interviews at CNBC Africa around 2013 into 2014, that's when I was still working as a full-time employee. Uh, so, and only really transitioned into the full world of entrepreneurship between 2015 and 2016, even though I had all the formalities of registering a business, having a tax um, clearance certificate and a BE certificate as early as in 2014. So even that gap was a two year gap where I really had to transition into thinking, evolving and working as an entrepreneur. Unlike just being a sole proprietor who had these two separate bank accounts, my personal account, and my business account and actually dipped into a bit of both whenever I needed a top up. So that's really where the journey started in terms of thinking and as an entrepreneur. And from 2016 to date, um, that's been the journey of fostering relationships with individuals like yourselves, which is now transitioned into um, this opportunity that we're engaging in. And of course, I'm speaking to many more um, individuals, building up with the necessary intellectual capacity, putting in the systems in place to network with other partners, and of course, making sure that you run effectively so that um, whilst I am the business, but the business is able to pay me in my personal capacity, a salary which keeps me going despite the volatility in the current environment that we're in. Okay, now quick one, that's awesome. And to me, it shows that journey. And more importantly, have you ever tried partnerships in terms of have you been approached for partnerships and how do you measure and decide on what partnerships are worth taking? And also, we had a question earlier on these contracts. Did you read a book and start writing contracts or um, how did you do it? It's important because a lot of people have faith in Google and Twitter and guys, Google and Twitter are just platforms. You need to deal with the real stuff. Did you get a, a Google book on contracts and also partnerships? Have you been approached? And when you said no, what, what are the decisions you need to take into consideration? Let me start with the partnerships question first, Mr. G. You're quite right. A lot of the time when it does come to establishing partnerships, there have been individuals um, who have approached me for certain partnerships. A lot of the time it is in our independent capacity where we look to start certain organizations and drive a particular narrative. One thing that was the short form, was an alignment in terms of strategy and clarity on the vision. And number two, making sure that we both adding the necessary equity into the pot. So for both parties to come together and just say, oh, well, I'm using my intellectual capital isn't quite enough when, uh, uh, because that again, as I said, meant leads to a, a misalignment in terms of vision um, and objectives. So I have said no, uh, at least twice um, to several partnerships. And that's where I found that perhaps because we are all building our little um, 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 establishments, which are primarily based on our own personal needs, on our own personal desires, as well as the industries that we've uh, aligned ourselves with, um, rather collaborate on certain partnerships and projects that might emerge. And that has often made it slightly easier to say, I'm working with Mr. G today because we want to build a bridge. But next week, when I build a tunnel, I'll work with Hillary. Uh, the week after, when I want to build a, a, a road, I'll actually work with Prem. So that's where it becomes slightly more efficient in working and aligning your strengths and partnerships together. The follow-up question, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. G, was not only partnerships, but contracts. Yes, very important. Especially, I think, because of this age where individuals run side hustles that might be service-based, 
or even pushing products. And sometimes we forget that you need to protect yourself with paperwork. If there's anything that big companies do well is putting things to paper to hold you to account. Uh, and that's the one lesson that I also had to learn that um, contracts, number one, where you are able to find resources. Again, there's a large number of institutions that do offer support for entrepreneurs and SMMEs in South Africa. So if you do Google, be mindful of actually looking for reputable institutions that are able to offer you some kind of template. But nine times out of 10, the template that you have will not be specific to your needs. I was in the fortunate position that I have often engaged with the professionals in the legal fraternity. Um, conducting interviews. So when I raised my hand to ask a fellow colleague that I had conducted an interview with, just to help me in terms of guidelines, that's actually where I got that opportunity to get additional support from them. And fortunately, that was a provided for pro bono. So again, leverage your networks to make sure that if you have a lawyer on call for free, quickly ask them if they can direct you to a specific person or industry or sector or company who can help you align with its contracts, insurance, and other specialized needs that you might have. But do make sure that you do personalize it to suit your, your individual business needs. Okay, before we call it a day, Owen, do you have something to say? Patience, I can open the mic, Puti, somebody answer. We want to, well, we're talking to ghosts, I, I, is everyone so afraid? It's important. And another part of business which we need to talk about is, um, is marriage regimes, etc. because it's a partnership. So the dissolution of a marriage is also can be the dissolution of your business. So it's important that we, we bear that in mind in terms of um, the, the things we need to do now. On the contract side, um, I see a question here around the policy. An insurance policy is exactly that, it's a contract. And um, you know, someone is saying that, I didn't know you could get uh, insurance on loans and you can get insurance on anything that can happen as long as an actuary can work out the probability of it happening, you can insure against it. There's none, there, there are very few things insurance companies will not insure against. It's the premium that's going to get you, but they will insure against anything. You can insure against somebody not paying you. You can insure against you not paying someone. You can insure against someone running away with your money. You can insure against the world's um, you know, ending in, 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 theoretically. But it's important to realize that's how important insurance is um, in your business. So yes, trade insurance. Um, I'll call back Hillary. Escrow. This word escrow, 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 it sounds fancy, eh? fancy, fancy, fancy. Escrow, okay? Now escrow is basically a facility where I'm buying something from Google, but until I see it at my house, she doesn't get the money. Because especially now that we're dealing with a virtual world, you can't just type in send. Because tomorrow when you click, log on to that website, you get that error 404. Sorry, we're gone with your money. So it's important that you realize that escrow is important. Hillary, does APSA offer extra accounts in terms of saying, um, I want to protect, they call it counterparty risk. You must use the fancy word, then they take you more seriously. Counterparty yes. Risk. No, certainly yes. Okay. So, so, so uh, escrow is the name that we have always known uh, from uh, from the past. There is now a lot more instruments uh, that cater for that type of risk uh, for counterparty risks, uh, whether it's domestic, whether it's international, and uh, you can imagine that if it's international uh, uh, risk or international counterparties, uh, the risk levels can actually be very highly elevated. So the bank offers comprehensive uh, arrangements for both domestic uh, and international counterpart risks. I think there was a question earlier on again, someone who wants to start an import export business. Import export, very important. Don't release funds until you've seen the goods. And normally your bank can talk to their bank and the banks can agree that they will only release the funding when the goods arrive in SA and they are satisfactory. Because sometimes these pictures, yo, it's like, You've seen the pictures what they do on, on, on social media, Google, yeah? And they put those, what they filters, and they look so handsome and beautiful, like, ah, these are not real people. How? <laughs> you know, I'm, uh, I'm waiting to get a filter as well. I'm going to do a filter picture on that. But it's important. Um, things don't always look the way they are when they arrive. And it's the same thing. And I think um, um, Tabitha is asking, I didn't know that a marriage regime can affect your, your business or your contract. <laughs> Tabitha. That other person in your life don't have, unless you've actually gone into an anti-natural contract 
with or without accrual, you they own half your business. They are just waiting. You know, you know when they say they're eating popcorn, waiting for the time they can come for your money. But it's been great, everyone. I mean, we can talk for hours. This is an important topic, yes. Um, but I thank all of you for joining us. Puti, Preska, Sam. Um, who else is on our roll call? Um, we've got Preska, Perlo, Noxie. We've seen all your questions. Uh, Mandy, uh, Mazizi, um, everyone. Thank you very much. This recording is available on the on the Sassy Facebook as well as YouTube. And we have two winners. We're giving money because our partners are banks. We said they must show us they are real bank. Must give us some money so we can see. So now I can't find the people who give you the money to. Oh, Tamron, there's so many questions. Um, okay, I'm going to find the people. It's in the chat, Gerald. It's in the it's chat to panelists. Oh, chat to panelists. There's so many chats going on. Okay, give us the names, Tamron. Please. So our winners for today, drumroll, are <laughs> Tabitha Kekana and Annalisa Plandayushi. Congratulations, we'll be in touch to get your bank details and you've each won 1,000 Rand courtesy of our sponsor, APSA. 1,000 Rand cash coming to you. Thank you very much, Google. Always a pleasure. We know your time is valuable. If you want to catch Google 6 p.m., Kai FM, I think she'll be on, or is it 5 p.m.? So she has to go quickly and do her other, other income generating um, opportunity. Hilary Mangwanya, APSA, we love you. You are great sponsors, great partners. Um, thank you for always supporting us. Prem Governor, our chairperson, she's been here making sure that I don't get too funny <laughs> and I behave myself. But Prem, thank you very much. Um, Tamarin in the background, making sure everyone is connected online, we thank you. And all the participants, thank you very much. My last thing is to give a throw forward. We've got one more webinar this month on the 28th of July, same bad channel, 2.30 next Wednesday. This is by far our most subscribed webinar. I've never seen people sign up to a webinar like this. There's a conspiracy going on. It's our webinar where we're talking to Wumandla, the power of a woman, the power of women, those strong women who are carrying households, carrying children, sometimes carrying baby husbands as well, and they're making things happen. Some of them are generating multiple income streams without complaints. So Wumandla next week, we are having uh, a, a, an expert panel of ladies who are going to talk and navigate the challenges of being a woman in COVID land and in South Africa, and sometimes also carrying baby husbands and baby children. You know, um, Prem Governor will be one of our speakers. We've got Lelane Bezentut, who's the CEO of the Financial Planning Institute of Southern, Southern Africa. And then we've got Esther Mukumba as well, who's um, big on social media. She's a mom and all week she's been posting dividends. Hey, I've never been so, hey guys, she's making money. Because if those dividends are coming through, she's doing something right with her finances. So she'll be joining us next week. So please do sign up. Why is it important to, to listen to the women? Here, my last word of advice. A woman has a womb, which a man does not have. And what's the purpose of the womb? The womb multiplies. So when one sperm goes into the womb, it comes out of the baby. That's the power of a woman. You give a woman good seed, good love, happiness. If you give her matata problems, have you seen miserable men? That's the <laughs> one. They blame the women, but no, it's their fault because the woman is only magnifying and multiplying. If you want your business to do well, same thing. Bring a woman into it. Yeah. Do it as a partnership. So I'm going to listen to the women because they know a thing or two about making things happen. South Africa, thank you very much. See you next week, same time. Thank you for all the chats. The questions which have not been answered, we will try and answer them in due course. It's 10 past four. I'm sorry, South Africa, but we're 10 minutes over, but please forgive me. Thank you very much. And we look forward to you joining us next week. Tamron, please make that song play. Otherwise, I'm going to sing again. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Should we join you, Mr. G? Uh, thank you for today. joining us. That's the song. Just say thank you for joining us. 
Thank you for joining us. <laughs> thank you for joining us. That's that's as simple as that. But thank you, everyone. We have over 130 people. That's great.